Why do they have this this high for you? Oh, your lapel miking. Very good. Good morning and welcome to the King Institute for Faith and Culture and to this year's fall faculty lecture. This is a tradition at King that goes back to somewhere in the 1960s in which every year students choose two faculty to do a lecture and faculty return the favor choosing two students. Our fall faculty lecture this year is Wendy Trainer, who has done this once before. Her first faculty lecture was four and a half years ago not quite long enough to do the same talk because some of you are still here. Um, we won't name names. Uh, she's taught at King since 2006. I just discovered moments ago, to my relative horror, that Wendy was born in South Dakota. I'm not sure how this explains anything, but it just, it just has thrown me a bit at the beginning of the lecture. She then tried out 10 other states, and after living in 11 different states, decided that Tennessee was the right place to be. So she's moved all over. She's lived in Germany as well, Alaska, South Dakota. She's been all over the place, and therefore I use the word in, the, in my uh, text for her peripatetic, because she likes when I use words like that. She serves as uh, uh, assistant professor of math at King, where she's been since 2006, and she's taught before that at every level elementary and high school, she's taught adult education, she's taught at the college and university level, teaching math and spreading joy wherever she goes. At King, she also serves as faculty advisor to baseball and to women's volleyball, and she is now our director of STEM outreach, in which role she's going to be doing a lot of community outreach to try to bring in students and also to bring in some grant money for our STEM programs here at King. She's a regular presenter at the International Conference on Technology and Collegiate Mathematics, which she'll be presenting at shortly, uh, as well again this year. But all those things are only a small part of what Wendy Trainer actually is at King. And I want to give you a little bit of my take on Wendy after many years of friendship and many years of working together. I do want to mention her bravery. Wendy, after all, is somebody who, defying federal law, defying military regulation, took a photograph at the Pentagon of a five-sided birdhouse. Her courage in that instance, I think the courage are coming to the front row, uh, her courage in that instance, only a small part of her bravery in general. This is also a woman who has appeared on the news in a uh, anorak with the hood pulled down. She's committed. She's here today in spite of the snowstorm crippling Bristol as we speak. <laughs> She's here today in spite of the fact that this is now her favorite season. She's giving up time and her favorite season of the year, yes, Hallmark season, has begun and Wendy's not there to watch. She's helpful. This is a woman who even last night, while she was preparing today's talk, was willing to respond to a desperate text from me because I was trying to help my son with his algebra. And I don't remember algebra from when I was in algebra in the 1890s. And therefore, I had to text her for help. This has happened a number of times. She's patient. She's still waiting on the Atlanta Falcons, who one day, <laughs> one day are going to come much. through for too, too soon. Too soon. And she is, uh, as any of you will know, in many respects, the heart and soul of the institution. She has brought energy and joy. She has brought wisdom and courage uh, to King's functioning in good times and bad. It's a joy to work with her. It's a joy to call her a friend. Please join me in welcoming Wendy Trainer. Uh, that was a lot nicer than I thought it would be, so I apologize for some slides later. <laughs> Dr. Dodderweich. Uh, I should have used Ryan Boer, who gave me the, the choke signal earlier. That would have, yeah, note to self. Uh, so it was, in fact, Dr. Diderweich that let me know that I was chosen to be the faculty lecturer. And so um, anytime you win something, it's great. And so it's like, yes, I win. Uh, and then it's like, oh, shoot, I have to make a speech. Um, and so uh, there are a lot of life lessons, some of which uh, Dr. Dodderweich alluded to that I thought, I've got good stories. I've learned great lessons. Um, I grew up in the military. There's a lot of good things there. And so maybe I could talk about some of those things. Um, 
Like, uh, some important lessons to learn are that um, military guards with automatic weapons sometimes don't have the best senses of, of humor. Um, sadly, the Pentagon incident was not my only time learning this. Uh, when I was 14, on the swim team in Germany, we were traveling to West Berlin, which you have to go through East Germany, which in 1984, uh, I was a very young swimmer in high school, obviously, <laughs> uh, is communist at the time, and so the train will stop and uh, in, in some of those places, and there are guards with weapons. Uh, I now know it is not okay to attempt to make them laugh out the window. Uh, you will get visited by a lot of very excited people. Um, but I can't make a speech about that. I can caution that maybe 30 years later you learn the same lesson that, that military guards with automatic weapons um, sometimes they're not amused, as you are, with the fact that the Pentagon has a Pentagon-shaped birdhouse. That's hilarious. Um, it is not, however, worthy of a photograph, as I, as I also now know. Um, so I thought that's a great life lesson, but I can't, again, make that the focus of my speech. I can just use it to, to stall. Um, I, I also have lived in the desert, and I know important things that people should know, like tarantulas uh, are a thing and that they can hop. Any desert people out here, California desert people? They leap and they leap high and um, that's an important thing people should know. Uh, there are snakes in the desert that will look one direction and travel the other direction, sometimes towards you and that's an important thing you need to know but that's not a, that's not a speech focus. Um, if you live in Alaska, you might move to Alaska, uh, and it's minus 20 every day, as it is in Fairbanks. Uh, some lessons you need to know are that your nose hairs will freeze instantly when you walk outside in that temperature. But that's a um, great life lesson, very memory-filled for me, but um, that's not a speech. So I had to talk to a lot of people about what to talk about. Um, we've had great faculty lectures in the past, and um, this, this probably won't, won't be one of them. Uh, but you're here, you're not outside where it's snowing, you're gonna get that CCS credit, and so really it's a win-win it's a for all of us. Um, so I did talk to a lot of people, I realized what I do every day may be a good focal point. And uh, some of the lessons that I've learned might be helpful, and I hope that they're helpful. And some of this will be funny, and some of it won't. Um, and so that's another, like, let's set that up right away. Again, expectations. But this is the focus of my talk, maybe a controversial statement. But this talk's going to be about perceptions and managing perceptions. And that really is what I do. Um, and that's what I've learned. And so um, that's what I want to talk about. And so some of this happens every day in class. Uh, how many of you either currently or in the past have had me for statistics? Okay, good. Of those of you who raised your hand, how many of you remember hearing me say repeatedly, this is more a reading comprehension class than it is a math class? Repeatedly, right? Okay, the rest of you, it, it's, it, it did happen. It's not a trick, I swear, right? Um, right? So that, just so that you know, that was my attempt at managing perception as a faculty member, as a teacher that teaches a subject that people don't like um, and people are afraid of. The truth is you can be successful at mathematics, but that's not the perception. And so what I do and what I have to do and what I spend my time doing is convincing students that their perception might not be accurate. And I've got to get that perception of I can't be good at math, I'm gonna fail this, this is hard. I've gotta get that to match the truth. And stating the truth won't do it, but managing perception will. So that made me think, okay, this is a good topic. It's a good exercise in leadership, it matches, and the field of statistics is filled with this example that perception might actually be more important than truth. So here's a graph, can't have a speech without a graph if you're a math person. This is like from a textbook, super boring graph. Uh, but what you're looking at is a graph, two different graphs that show the same truth 
the same numbers, the same story, but very different perceptions create a different truth. The one on your left, the scale is manufactured so that the interest rates, which is what this was about, mortgage rates from 2008 to 2012, look like they're very volatile, that there's a massive increase. The one on the right, the scale is different, and so it looks like it's steady. Perception has a lot to do with truth. Truth can be uh, manipulated if you're not careful. Same data, but this one's more fluid, but it shows the same concept. Same information, same numbers are being graphed, but one looks much more volatile than the other. That's boring. Uh, higher education cares a lot about numbers. And they care a lot about birth rates. And there's a lot of discussion about being able to predict how many college students show up. This is a common thing that all colleges do. And there is a great indicator of how many incoming freshmen you can have, and it's based on birth rates. So birth rates fluctuate, and if you have a high birth rate one year, 18 years from now, you can expect a higher amount of students going to college. And so this is a graph that a lot of colleges got really excited about, and it has to do with that recession that we had about 2008. 2008, this country went through a recession, and when that happens, people stop getting married, they stop having children, they slow all that down, and so the birth rate went down. And 18 years from then will be 2026. And so this graph got a lot of attention because it shows, oh my gosh, we're about to have a massive decline in the number of students that are going into colleges, okay? But this is why perception is important and this is why being aware of perception is important. When you back that up and include more historical perspective, what you actually see is that it's not just a massive crash. It's we're going through an incline. And it's happening right now because leading up to that recession, everybody felt good. They felt great. They were able to buy houses. The economy looked good. And so they were having children. They were getting married. And that peaked 2025 is where they, they will come into play, but it peaked into 2007. And so what's actually happening is we're regulating it. And it's going way up and it's coming back down to about where it was. Total different situation than the catastrophic look there. Perception is important, and managing that and being aware of that is important. So it happens. It said, don't feel bad. Don't feel bad, right? Perception is important. Act like it's not yours. <laughs> Key point, right? Look around. Who's, who's doing that? Uh, this happens to you all the time. You don't even know it. Corporations do this. All marketing departments are all about managing perception. And Disney is the best at it. Uh, if you go to Disney parks, Disneyland, Disney World, uh, Paris Disney, I don't think we're that bougie in here, but it could happen. Um, you can't do anything about crowds. They can't do anything about crowds, and they can't really do anything about wait time. It's very expensive to go to Disney, and they want you to leave feeling like you got a good value. And so if all you're doing is spending your time in line, maybe the perception is that uh, maybe it wasn't such a great value. And so what they did is they did what they could to control the truth, which was control the numbers. So they did the fast pass, and they did the single rider lines. All the single writers. This is a song we sing. All the single writers. It's a thing. Uh, anyway, <laughs> this is a, let's just put that behind us and go on. <clears throat> so what they did is they managed the perception. So think about Haunted Mansion ride. How many of you have been on that one? Haunted Mansion. Okay, you get in line and you think, oh my gosh, the sign says it's going to be 75 minutes. But eventually you get to the back and you enter this graveyard scene, and so now you're part of the experience. And it doesn't feel like you're in line. And you're busy reading these funny tombstones that are around, like Mr. Sewell, the victim of a dirty duel. Well, rhyming's fun. 
especially, especially when you couple it with a grave. Uh, at peaceful rest lives Brother Claude planted here beneath this sod. So everybody's walking around, they're reading the signs, you're taking pictures of them, you're sharing with everybody. Uh, dear departed Brother Dave, he chased a bear into a cave. You know, they're not, they're not earth-shattering ringers of comedy, but it's something. And so they've managed the perception at Disney to make you feel like you are already part of the experience before you're actually there. And then they put you in the room. You know the room I'm talking about? If you haven't written it, you don't know the room. Uh, you get inside and you get crammed into this, this round room and they cram a bunch of people in it, which by the way, if you're short, that's a different experience. It's a lot of armpits. Some of you see a lot of heads. I see a lot of armpits in those, but again, that's that's for another time. Uh, and so they, they, they shut the door and the lights are dim and they give you this scary story and you're looking at these paintings and this is a whole different concept of perception, reality, but they give you the backstory of these people and um, you think you're on the ride and you think that this is part of the experience. You're still in line, you just don't know it. The reality has been changed, perception's been changed. And then like it feels like you're sinking but the the ceiling rises and they reveal the rest of the picture which is like a whole different situation presents itself. Um, that's, you know, anyway. But then the door opens and then the real ride, you're like, oh, you get on these little things and then you go on a conveyor belt. That's the real ride. But what they did is make you think for the last 20 or 30 minutes, you were not in line. Uh, you were enjoying the experience. And that's managing perception and that's the power of it. They do the same thing with the Peter Pan ride, which is my favorite. Uh, they weave the line through a makeshift house. I don't know the family's name, I just know it's Wendy's house because it's Wendy's house. Um, and so they make it look like um, it's very detailed and that's what you're concentrating on and they do some CGI stuff, but you're not really on the ride. It just feels like you are. Managing perception. So um, if you're a corporation person or a marketing person, this is gonna be your world, but what if you're not? How can you use that? Everybody has seen this play out in their relationships. Dating relationships, friendships, bosses. Stating truth never changes perception. That's my bold statement. Case in point, I don't think you're listening to me. You know what never ends that? Yes, I am. Because what's the follow-up question? What did I say? Right? A statement of Yes, I'm listening to you. That won't end the perception, and the perception is really the problem, not the statement of truth. And so the follow-up question, even if they can recount, which, by the way, is some of the most infuriating marital moments you can have when you think, when you think your spouse is not listening to you and you've got them. Are you listening to me? Yes, I'm listening to you. What did I just say? And then they can name off everything. Like even more than you're like, oh shoot, that is exactly what I said. Uh, it's, it's maddening, right? But, uh, but that's still, you still have the issue of perception. And so I would say this, if your leadership style or your friendship style or your relationship style is just restating the truth and thinking that's enough, it probably isn't. Managing the perception is going to be your key and getting those two to meet are where your focal point. If the truth is a good thing, if the truth is a bad thing, you're trying to hide it, that's a whole different, that's a whole different thing. If you really aren't listening, would, you'd be better off just to say, I sure am not. Um, maybe not in that tone because you got a, another bag of worms on your hands there. But that's what I would say your goal is. Make those two things meet. Work on the perception, and if you're not in tune with the perception of the people on your team, or uh, the people in your classroom, or the people in your family, or the people that work for you, or the people that you work for, you're gonna miss, you're gonna miss making sure that your truth is known. Uh, manipulating perceptions, I am good at it. I do it about every two to three months. And I like to give you the perception that I am A, blonde, and B, so are my roots. Neither of those are true. Uh, however, there is probably a trillion dollar industry out there because to some degree we're all a little bit concerned with managing perceptions. And while that can be a good thing, if that's your whole focal of using it to hide the truth, 
Maybe it's a bad thing. Maybe it's just a great way to spend a Thursday, which that's the way I thought, especially if you get free coffee there. Uh, but beware of this in, in, as a leadership style as well. Are you spending your time spinning? Spinning and manipulating to make people think that what the truth really is is not what's happening there. And if that's the case, be aware of it. Uh, generally, it's not going to work out and you're going to have a bigger problem on your hands. Um, honesty is the best policy. I don't use it all the time, but I try to. And I'm not standing up here because I'm great at it. Um, but I see a lot of people manipulating perceptions as if they are paying attention. And while I applaud it and I encourage it, um, <laughs> sometimes the most refreshing texters are the ones that are just out there, right out there in the open, uh, even on the end of the pew, just out there so that nobody has to wonder if that person is really who they are, right? There's something to be said for truth. Uh, but be careful if all you're doing is manipulating perceptions. This is why diversity is important. I bet you if you ask any corporate leader or any leader if they think diversity in the workforce is important, they will say yes. But I'll bet you a lot of them couldn't tell you why. I want to tell you why. It matters to me, which is a lot of what I do with women in STEM, because women are underrepresented in those fields. And that's important. Because diversity is important, not only in gender, but in race, in culture, in uh, economic status, because everybody's got different perceptions, and everybody's got different perspectives. And if your only perception that you are aware of are from those like you, you're not going to manage them very well. So if you're a leader and somebody says, is diversity important to you, you say, yes, and I can tell you why, and then you can quote perception. There are lots of other reasons why diversity is important, obviously, but that's one of the reasons right there. And then managing your own internal perceptions. This is a lesson I learned, and it's not fun because it involves mental health. And I thought, boy, that's going to be surprising that I'm standing up here and I'm going to talk about a serious subject. But then I thought, maybe Wendy Trainer talking about mental health is not really a surprising thing for, for a lot of people. Um, but when you teach math, you're aware of mental health regularly because math frustrates people, and you see a lot of that. Um, so I went to a speech. I go to a lot of speeches. You go to a lot of speeches. But some of them I do listen to, and so this one resonated with me, and I hope that you might be able to hear it. And what that person mentioned is that um, in life you have a lot of stressors that come your way. And these will fill up a meter, basically, if you think of like a graduated cylinder. This chemistry people, that's for you. Um, right? And so what the speaker really described is that everybody's got one of those inside them. They have a meter inside them that can handle a certain amount of I don't know that they use that graphic, but I like envisioned an actual cylinder. Maybe that's a STEM thing. I don't know. Other it, hey, uh, and so as those things come to you, your meter is going to be at any given point, at any given week. Maybe it's not so full. Maybe it's all the way full. And giving a speech to you all in December means most of the people sitting in here, your meter is probably pretty high, your stress level, your stress meter. You're about to go into finals. Your professors have given you papers and projects. Everybody loves an end of the semester project to include probably all of your professors, and they're all happening at once. Uh, luckily, nobody procrastinated, and so that will help uh, everybody's meter. Uh, it's also holiday season, and while that is joyous, it's probably becoming more stressful for people than it is joyous. Um, and so, being aware of your own perceptions because of your own internal me meter is important. So, um, this is a concept that was described to me based on that meter conversation. So, let's say this happens to you. Uh, you get a D plus. I, did, I couldn't go F. It was too much. <laughs> it was too cruel. But D plus, right? It's bad, but it's not terribly bad. And I don't know why it's laughing, but I, that I think sometimes students 
If a D plus is handed back that this is what's going on, it's like some level of mockery, right? But this creates like this cloud, this stressor. Well, two different people with an internal level, regardless of whether that level is high because they're carrying around a lot of trauma or they're carrying around a lot of stress they haven't managed, if the meter is high versus a regular level, then that same amount of stress is going to max one person out while the other person just had more crap put on them. And that's where perception internally really matters and seeing people for that, seeing yourself for that, and seeing others for that is important. And when I heard this concept, it was like earth shattering to me. Because what it meant was something that may seem small to me might be colossal to somebody else because the perception is how much am I available stress meter is this thing creating? Is it creating 100% of what I have left? And if so, there's a meltdown. Or is it just taking up 25%? And so that was just a concept that was like huge to me. And when my family went to this speech, uh, we had a meter full situation on our hands. I mean, all the way full, which is at meltdown level, which is why we were seeking for like, what do we do? So daily stress is easy to manage. You were in, uh, you hear it all the time, right? Yoga, exercise, getting plenty of rest uh, is important because that will lower your stress level. Getting plenty of rest. Maybe not at a party at a friend's house, um, but still that can manage your stress. I, again, I thought, I thought the intro would be, would be more cruel, right? Uh, Doing something that you love to do. I like to fly fish. But uh, the thing... The thing about fly fishing, oh, that's too much, it's too much, uh, is that you cannot concentrate on anything else when you're fly fishing because you got a lot going on. You're trying to match the fly and you're trying to tie it on there. And I have tiny little hands, but it's incredibly hard even to tie a tiny little fly. Um, my husband has giant hands because he's a big person, and I don't know why he is better at it than I am, but, but he is. Um, but that's why fly fishing is key because you can't think about all your stuff. You just get out. Um, and you, you're not killing the fish, so, so you and then and you let him go, and he's happy, and you're happy, and he learned a life lesson, um, <laughs> right? Spending time with friends that lower your stress level. Getting away. Uh, it was getting to go to Florida with the women's volleyball team. Uh, I couldn't crop Boer out of the picture, but I, had I had more time, I would have. I would have done so. Uh, Getting yourself involved at King will lower your stress level because you get to have conversations with people who are going through similar experiences. That's why uh, clubs are so important and involvement with them and you're giving back to your community. Um, getting together with your team, having just moments where you goof off. Obviously all these things help manage stress. And for you this Thursday night, the late night breakfast exam break. I always get those words out of order. Um, taking advantage of what Slack has to offer this week and next week is gonna be key to you because you're gonna need those breaks to lower your stress. And so I would tell you that that is like the number one stress relieving activity on campus. Not to be missed that right there. Here's what else I learned. Uh, you can't always bring your meter down yourself. And we learned this uh, the hard way. Sometimes it's gonna take professional help and sometimes it's gonna take prescribed medication. See what I mean? Like that's kind of a downer that I'm standing up here telling you this. But it was earth shattering to me because uh, what you hear in relation to mental illness and anxiety and depression is that um, you, know, you just need to try harder. You need to have more faith. Um, you know, you, if you just would uh, go out and exercise, you would be fine. If you just would do X, Y, Z, you would be okay and you would be able to lower it. There are some things that people have gone through that you can't lower on your own and you can't wish away. And so uh, prayer is on there because I think it's a key component. But I want to make sure that we all understand there are lots of ways prayers get answered. And saying to somebody, 
uh, if you just prayed hard enough, you would not be at that level of anxiety, can be very damaging because the prayer could be answered by that person going to get professional help or getting the right medication. So this is something to a Christian community that I think is important to hear. And I'm not saying that I don't think prayer can cure things because I do absolutely. But sometimes the answer to prayer is not if you just had more faith, you would be better. Um, that's important, I think, for people to hear. So my story with that, I've got two of them, only one that I'll tell today uh, because it, it's just got a happy ending. Um, and also I have a cute picture. Oh my gosh, that's so sweet. So um, we, uh, this is my son. When my son was born, he was born in Alaska. Uh, we had a whole myriad of things before. And um, when he was born, he was covered in petechiae, which my nursing students will know is like broken blood vessels that look like little red freckles everywhere. But he was covered everywhere. Um, and so I was like, oh, that baby has a lot of freckles. And then uh, everybody's face changed and your baby goes away. And so then um, you hear things like hemorrhaging in the back of his skull and blood in the spinal fluid, and we're not sure where we are. And that will fill a meter instantly. That's trauma. That's big. And so um, if that happens to you, and some of you it already has, and some of you it might, and it happened to us that day, the body really has an amazing way of kind of going into autopilot. And I think that's what happened to me. I couldn't receive anymore. And I think that that was a prayer answer that there was a block put on that meter. So I didn't like lose it. So I wasn't able to receive anymore. My meter was full. I think there was a cap. And that's the way I see prayer. And I think that was other people praying, which I think is why it's important to pray for other people. Because sometimes you, you can't pray for yourself if you're in a certain situation. Um, and so we had to be medevaced, which is an army term for you get on an emergency plane because we were in Fairbanks, Alaska. Not a lot of great medical care. In fact, true story, my anesthesiologist was moose hunting at the time. Like, is that the most cliche thing you have ever heard? But it is true. And uh, so they had to bring him in from his moose hunt. Uh, he wasn't wearing the hat, though, so I was kind of disappointed. But uh, nor was he a Mountie. Uh, but that's a, that's a different story. <clears throat> um, so they put you on a plane. It's a medevac plane, and so it's to send soldiers, essentially, and airmen down to uh, Washington, Washington State, Seattle, Washington, where really good care can happen. And so um, there's my baby in like the isolate, which if anybody's ever had a baby in an intensive care unit is like the incubator thing. And he's strapped to a stretcher in the front of the plane on top of like, uh, people in various states of injury and consciousness. If that does not fill a meter, I mean, that's up there. Um, but this, again, my other example about prayer might have sounded like I was not in favor of it. And so that's why I wanted to make sure to tell this story. That's where prayer can come into play, is maybe this obstacle is not going to be removed, but your ability to cope can be capped and can be handled until there's time for an answer to prayer. And sometimes it's the answer you want and sometimes it's not. Um, so the end of the story is not really as exciting as the beginning. Um, eventually, he just got better. And we stayed in that hospital down there for a week and a half. And then we got to come home. And now he is a grown grown man. It's hard to say that because I always say it a different way. But now he's a grown man uh, and he's doing great and he's, you know, six foot something. Um, but I, I will say that um, sometimes you can't manage your own meter and that's why you need to have people around you that are a strong support base. So what are the takeaways? Oh, oh shoot. I mean, Hold on. So that's why you need people around you that are strong base. And sometimes, sometimes the answer is not removing the difficulty. Sometimes the answer is making your meter 
a little bit bigger so that you can handle more. So if you've ever known people in your life that you feel like, good gosh, everything happens to that family. How are they able to go through it? It is likely that the answer to prayer or the answer to their own therapy or their own growth is that that meter is bigger. And I think that's something that we're all, we're all capable of. There we go. So what are the takeaways? Takeaways. Uh, you can't just expect to state your truth and think that that is going to matter or that that's going to change things. You need to be aware of the perceptions. Uh, millennials, which I think I learned, we're really, our college students are really more Gen Z. You've got perceptions you're going to have to fight against when you apply for a job and you start a job. There are perceptions out there uh, about millennials that you're going to have to fight through. And so the truth of saying, I'm not like that. I'm not uh, glued to my phone, or I can listen and look at my phone at the same time. Well, it's not so true, but... Um, you got to be aware of that. You have to be aware of the perceptions about you, and you have to be aware of the perceptions of the people you're trying to lead. But think about that when you're applying for jobs. Um, the importance of perception, again, is why diversity in the workforce is so important. You need to hear from and receive information from a variety of people. Uh, just a group of men and no women is not going to give you the perspective that you need. Just a group of Caucasians and no one of color is not going to give you the perception and the reception that you need. People just from the South, without other people included, you're going to get a very single idea of what's going on. Uh, find healthy ways to lower that meter. I didn't get into all the bad ways we all do. I can get my meter lowered like that, doing bad things, <laughs> and it works like a charm, right? Uh, a big thing of mashed potatoes, yes. all the way down. Um, alcohol, Works like a charm. Let's not pretend like it doesn't. However, hear me, it's a temporary, and then what happens is your meter actually is more full than it was before because these are negative things. And if that's what you're relying on to reduce your meter, you got bigger problems. So find healthy ways to keep them. And I think probably the most important takeaway is that that is why math is important. <laughs> um, yeah. So thank you. Thank you for staying with me. You did good. We're still out early. I appreciate it. I learned from Wendy's talk, even then, learned from Disney, and that perception reality. So the reality is that Wendy's not getting paid, but the perception is a handsome black what? is going to be hers at the end of the day. Oh, she's oh excited my about gosh. This. So here's your black. Oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Oh. My perception is joy. Thank you. Yep. Uh, thank Appreciate you for being it. here. The perfect de-stressor for the beginning of your last week of classes. Uh, have a good week and come and exam breakfast on Thursday.